welcome to Story Hour in the Library. We'd like to thank our author this month, Scott Saul, for joining us. We'd also like to let you know that he will be Sorry, we will be selling his books. Revolution Books is selling at front, and he is happy to sign them after the reading. We'd like to invite you back next month for Zoe Ferreris on April 14 at 5 p.m. back here in the Morrison. And if you'd like to find out more about Story Hour in the library, you can visit storyhour.berkeley.edu, see our full lineup plus past videos of past authors we've had. And if you'd like to sign up for our email list at the front, um, there's just a way for you to sign up for either library updates as well as Story Hour updates. Now I'd like to invite Vikram up to do our introduction. Hi, uh, so Melanie and I first met Scott uh, about a decade ago when we first moved to Berkeley. And it turned out that both he and Melanie had grown up in LA. So within 10 minutes, they were discussing common acquaintances and so on. Um, he's since been a generous colleague in the English department and a good friend to both of us. So it's indeed a great pleasure to welcome Scott to Story Hour. Uh, uh, before I tell you about his other work, I want to tell you about some, a new project that he's doing. It's a literary podcast uh, called chapterversepod.com. So you should definitely go and check it out. He's got some really awesome people uh, on the podcast. So back to, back to literature in another way. Scott's first book published in 2005 was Freedom, freedom Is, Freedom Ain't, Jazz and the Making of the 60s. The book examines the history of jazz during the late 50s and through the 60s and the relationship of this aesthetic development with the political and social changes of the time. Adam Gussow wrote in American literature that freedom is, freedom ain't, is that rarity in academic studies, a book one is tempted to read a second time purely for pleasure. Saul writes with a musician's working knowledge of craft and a cultural journalist narrative and stylistic panache. His next book, Becoming Richard Pryor, was published in 2014. In an interview, Scott talked about how the seeds of the book came from a local mystery. What did Richard Pryor do when he lived in Berkeley in the late 60s? The search for an answer led him to the archives of KPFA in an encounter with previously unheard tape recordings of conversations with Pryor and many other treasures. I'll let him tell you the story of those discoveries, but I will tell you that in the interview, Scott said that finding these tapes felt like he had been raptured to biographer heaven. I'm grateful for that rapture as a reader because reading his book is also a transporting experience. The book serves as a wonderfully insightful and intelligent history of a man and a culture, but it also has the narrative drive, empathy, and the immediacy of a novel. There is, for instance, Scott's evocation of prior childhood. And I quote, in the films Richard loved, violence had a purpose. In his home life, violence was often both senseless and inexplicable. One of the strongest memories of growing up in his grandmother's brothel was being woken in the middle of the night by screams without knowing where they came from. It's moments like these, I think, that led Bonnie Greer to write in the UK Independent that the book was, quote, a magisterial biography slash pian slash mea culpa for Richard Pryor and to conclude that it revealed itself to be not simply a biography, but the compassionate map of a terra incognita. In The Cleveland Plain Dealer, Michael Eaton aptly described the book as a pop culture masterpiece of exhaustive reporting, psychological insight, and elegant writing. Please join me in welcoming Scott Salk. Um, well, thank you. I thank all of you for braving the rain and being here. It's a great crowd. I'm, I'm really honored to be here in this wonderful series curated by Vikram and Melanie. Uh, thank you, Vikram, for that lovely introduction. Uh, thanks to Gabriel uh, Gillard for coordinating the arrangements. And uh, thank you to the good people at Revolution Books for coming out here, supplying books uh, for the book event. And I'm very happy to you know, sign, write, compose many essays to your cousin Mel or whatever you want me to do um, after this event. Um, now, let me move to this. Um, because you know this is a biography, not a work of fiction, I thought it'd be better not uh, just to read from my book, uh, but rather to talk about Pryor's life and artistic legacy. 
and to walk you through some moments of discovery that I had uh, as his biographer, uh, where I was trying to reconstruct his life uh, from the traces, the fugitive traces that he, uh, it left, and some moments when these kind of discoveries forced me to recognize that I had to tell his story in a fundamentally different way than had been told uh, by previous um, biographers. Now, there have been a number of people who had tried to tell Pryor's story, um, but I think it's fair to say that none of them really were a thoroughly researched um, account of his life uh, that was bringing together kind of the tools of a detective and of a historian to really go to the shadow side of history and, and see uh, where he came from and, and what his life entailed. Um, now, I thought I would start, though, by talking a bit about this cover uh, of my book, because this is a cover that I worked on a, a bit, uh, collaborated with the book designer. And uh, I think it telegraphs for me uh, both the achievement of Richard Pryor and the aspiration uh, behind the book. Now, a lot of people agree with this, you know, pretty much every stand-up comedian that you could talk to uh, would agree with Jerry Seinfeld's assessment uh, that, you know, Richard Pryor, he's called him the Picasso of our profession. I think that's pretty much the conventional wisdom. Uh, he was an astonishingly creative performer who transformed what was possible in the realm of comedy. And that's coming not just from people like, um, of, say, the later generation, Jerry Seinfeld. It's coming from people like Mel Brooks, who when asked, you know, who was the funniest comedian of all time? Was it uh, Charlie Chaplin, Harpo Marx, Buster Keaton? He said, no, it's Richard Pryor, who he helped. You know, they co-wrote Blazing Saddles together. Some of you probably know that. Bob Newhart, uh, another earlier comedian, said he was the single most seminal comedic influence in the past 50 years. And after Pryor, um, a lot of comedians have echoed a very eloquent tribute that Bernie Mac paid to Pryor when he said, without Richard, there would be no me. You know, he sensed that he blazed these paths that were really the, the paths that later comedians went down. But you know, if, if Damon Wayans has said, Pryor was the comedian who started it all, the question is, well, what did he start? And I just want to telegraph that a bit by talking about this cover and the kind of the difficulty of finding the right cover for, for Pryor because of the complexity of what he was trying to do. If you look at some of the previous covers that have been used for other biographies or treatments of Pryor, um, you see that they framed him on the left. He's put on that Richard Pryor black and blue. It's sort of he's a highly theatrical funny man, you know, a kind of clown entertainer. Uh, the middle cover sort of telegraphs him as a sort of confused soul, you know, with his head in his hands. Um, the third cover, this really wonderful book by Mel Watkins on African American comedy, and he basically says that Pryor is sort of the apogee of African American comedy. And uh, he frames him, uh, that cover frames Pryor as an iconoclast, you know, who's thumbing his nose at society uh, by picking it. So, a kind of vulgarian with social purpose. Um, and I thought those were not quite uh, what I wanted to do. And this is, so I asked the designer to come up with something interesting, and this is what we got, which I was not happy with at all. I'll just uh, share that. I'm getting back behind the scenes of the uh, creative process here. Uh, the first one, I was like, well, I hated the font. It looked to me like it was from HR Puff and stuff, way 270s. Uh, you know, uh, the bar, stri Stars and Stripes, very distracting. And then why isn't he wearing a shirt? This is something my wife uh, said, which is a very good question. And it really drew way too much attention uh, to him as some, uh, a body, but not a mind. There's not enough intentionality in his, in his look there. He looks aimless. And what I found in my, bio, in my detective work of reconstructing his life is that he was a, a very determined, a very inventive person. You don't get that. The second cover we came up with suggests a bit more uh, his, uh, the elasticity of his face, his gift for physical comedy. The, it emphasizes the act of becoming all these different characters. But uh, to me, the problem with it was it was too distant. It didn't give you the sense of what the biography is going to do, which is force you to reckon with him, force you into a, a kind of intense relationship with this person you're reading about. So then uh, we came up with this, which I'm really happy with, uh, I have to say. Um, and the reason I'm happy with this is it kind of plays with a sort of a visual pun. Uh, and the visual pun is that you know, when you have a book cover, the book cover is two-dimensional. Images are two-dimensional. 
But here, we're kind of playing with how his face pokes out from the way he's being framed. So you get a sense of depth. The image looks uh, three-dimensional. And the way he achieves that kind of three-dimensionality is by poking through the box that's been constructed around him. He's sort of boxed in by the name he's made for himself, but he's also popping outside the frame. And there were so many ways that Pryor did that in his comedy again and again. People want to put him in a certain box, and he would break the rules. If he was playing, uh, he was in a comedy, he would bring in notes of drama. If he was in a drama, he would bring in notes of levity, and so on. He always scrambled the formulas and the genres that he was working with. Um, the second reason I really like this is just because of that look, which strikes me as a much more uh, important kind of prior expression than the other ones of those other uh, images. It suggests, uh, I think, the, the complexity, the inner complexity that he uh, uh, brought to comedy through the kind of outer mask that he would take on in his comedy. I see it uh, as it's both uh, an invitation and a confrontation. Um, it's an invitation to intimacy the way that he's looking at us, uh, pretty much straight on, uh, asking us um, to kind of come into contact with him, which is something that you wouldn't say so many comedians before him had done, to expose uh, your interior life, your fears, your self-loathing, uh, your intimate details of your sexual life, uh, your feelings about your community, and so on. Um, but there's also a confrontation there. Uh, there is a way that he is forcing us to look at ourselves in some ways through that different pair of eyes. And I really loved it. This was um, made into a kind of a blown up poster, uh, which then Mrs. Dalloway's uh, in Berkeley here put in their window. And I really love that because they put it in their window and then anybody walking down College Avenue felt like the eyes of Richard Pryor were kind of following them like in those uh, you know, haunted houses. And, and I think that's partly uh, what he did. Uh, in American culture uh, by becoming uh, a, a huge Hollywood star, a great comedian, is he forced people to think about life as it, was, as it was lived, as it was understood, as it was improvised upon by this uh, incredible performer who came out of a black working class world that typically uh, hadn't been front and center uh, in Hollywood or in American popular culture. Now, I, before I talk about writing the biography, I just want to note how, how amazing it is that Richard Pryor achieved this three-dimensionality, uh, how innovative uh, he was um, to do that. Um, I, I do consider him, in some ways, the most unlikely star in Hollywood history. Um, if you think about w the models he had when he was growing up uh, for being a black actor, um, when he loved to go to these theaters in Peoria, Illinois, movie theater cinemas. Uh, he would have to sit largely in the segregated section, right, the balcony. But he loved going there. Um, and when he watched those movies in the 40s, right, uh, black actors were always the supporting actor, right? They were, they, black men, they would be a delivery man. They would be a porter, right? They would be a valet, a supporting actor, a cameo, sometimes comic. Supporting actor always supporting the white actor who was the star, of course. Um, and he became a, a great, the, he actually began with a lot of cameo roles in Hollywood, and then he would improvise and improvise. He was asked to be a thief in Silver Streak, but he would improvise and improvise with Gene Wilder, and suddenly he couldn't be contained in that role, and suddenly he's co billed as its star. And that happened quite a lot for him. The second thing I note about the comedy that he took in and that inspired him to take the stage when he's in Peoria growing up is that he loved comedies. You know, uh, he loved Jerry Lewis. He loved Sid Caesar. He loved Red Skelton. He was very inspired by a largely Jewish wave of comedians uh, that he watched on TV and in those movie theaters. And this was comedy that was broad. It was physical. It was antic, um, zany. Um, these are comedians that are wonderful. Again, they inspired him, but they weren't reaching for the kind of psychological complexity uh, that he achieved. So that's the three-dimensionality in brief that he, he brought to the American stage and to American film. Um, the question then is, 
how would I try to recover that and what allowed him to be that kind of artist? So I'm going to step through a few moments of discovery I had with this book. The first is, Vikram, is one that Vikram alluded to, uh, which was the mystery of how Berkeley changed Pryor. Now, earlier biographers, uh, taking a cue from Pryor himself, had said, you know, everything changed when he came to Berkeley. Something happened there. Um, but Pryor was very hazy on the details, and earlier biographers hadn't really been able to track down even when he came to Berkeley. Um, the, the idea is that he came to Berkeley and he was basically a comic still operating in the mold of Bill Cosby. And then he came out of Berkeley and he was a militant provocateur. Uh, but what happened? When did it even happen? Um, you know, uh, we knew uh, that he hung out with a, a group of writers, um, black writers like uh, Cecil Brown, uh, Ishmael Reed, Claude Brown. Uh, but again, the question is, well, how did that affect uh, his art? And that led me to kind of trace, to follow the one detail we definitely did know uh, that was kind of hard detail, which was that he had DJed for a bit for KPFA, which, as you can imagine, was kind of a switchboard of the, East, uh, of the Bay Area left uh, it, from the 50s to the, to the present, uh, especially in the late 60s and 70s. And so I went to the North Hollywood archives of KPFA, and I went through all their newsletters. And I just, you know, people had thought, when did, when did Pryor get to Berkeley? Some people said 67. Some people said 71. So I went through all these newsletters. And I discovered 67, no mention of Pryor, 68, no mention of Pryor, and so on. Until the end, 1970, suddenly Richard Pryor pops up in a column written by Alan Farley, who we'll talk about in a second, um, on media. And then by, he starts popping up with increasing frequency until by 19, September 1971, he's, having his, he's been given his own show uh, as part of this slate of programming called Mondo Banana, right? Uh, a sh sh evening show, very loose in structure. It was called, you know, Music, Satire, Horror, and Poetry for the Organic Universalists of the San Francisco Bay. Um, and here's the ad shows the banana peel popping out of the globe. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues joked that like, if you took this ad, you could roll it up and you smoke it. You could still get a contact high uh, from 1971. Um, so we knew that. So he, he gets more and more involved in KPFA. Uh, and it was Alan Farley was the person who seemed to be writing about prior quite a bit. I discovered um, that Alan Farley was still working in public radio at the time. Unfortunately, now he's passed. And I, I so, feel so blessed that I reached him uh, before um, he, he died of liver cancer. Um, so Alan Farley, I talked to him. Uh, he was uh, working at this point at public radio KALW. And I interviewed him. And in the middle of that interview, he revealed many things. Uh, first of all, that Pryor had really come to Berkeley in February of 1971 after an earthquake in LA. Um, he had actually been his roommate when Pryor had first settled uh, in Berkeley. Um, but most importantly, he revealed that he was kind of a gearhead. And uh, he was operations manager of KPFA. Uh, so he had access to all his taping equipment. And he believed, because he was very interested in social satire, that Richard Pryor was one of the most important artists of the time. There might have been like five people at the time who believed that because this is well before Pryor's landmark albums. Um, but Alan Farley believed that, and then this amazing satirist was his roommate, was crashing. Uh, he, he gave Richard Pryor his bedroom, and Farley crashed on the couch and cooked him spaghetti and stuff like that. Anyway, so Alan wanted, he recorded everything that Richard Pryor had done. Uh, not only that, at some point he started loaning out his taping equipment so that Richard Pryor could just experiment for himself. And then Alan would meticulously label everything and stash it away for posterity. And he was like, do you want to listen to this? I was like, of course. So this, was, this prompted my uh, rapture to Biography Heaven when I realized there was these seven hours or so of these tapes uh, that had been made. And uh, I'll play you a few little samples from it. Um, but one thing I would note is there's you know, 20 or so different things that were part of these seven hours of recordings. And I would basically say that no two of them were the same. They were intensely different. Prior, 
Uh, he was experimenting with his, his stand-up. He's also trying to, he was like an artist in search of his genre, his medium. So I'll play a little bit from, uh, he tried to create some stream of consciousness poetry. And this will give you a sense of where his brain was at. Um, what did he say? He, I think he said that he, he in, the, in the beginning, he says, you know, he created this when he was high on whiskey and cocaine and insecurity and guilt. It's like a 3 a.m. of the soul. But one thing you can take away from this is that, you know, for pr prior, coming to Berkeley was an experience of hi hibernation, intense hibernation. He kind of retreated into this cave and into asceticism, uh, paring away his self uh, in an environment that, on um, one sense, was intensely solitary. It's that sense of he's giving up all he's inherited. Uh, you know, he was in some ways, he had been very successful in LA before he came to Berkeley through mainstream venues like Merv Griffin and Ed Sullivan. He's like, I'm not gonna do that anymore. And you hear that stream of consciousness and you said, this is not a guy who's looking to entertain, right, uh, at all. Um, at the same time, one of the other things that happened in Berkeley, uh, and you can hear this from a second thing I'll play, is that Pryor was engaging in a more forthright way than he had ever before in the movements of the time, the movements of, you know, circa 1971, the anti-war movement, uh, when he comes to Berkeley, it's, it's just uh, the, uh, Nixon and Kissinger have expanded uh, the war, Vietnam War into Laos, and there's basically tear gas still in the air uh, um, from a demonstration when he arrives here. Uh, the Black Power Movement, uh, the Prisoners' Rights Movement, uh, environmental movement, and so on. And uh, he's engaging with these movements quite intensely. Um, one thing that sparks um, engagement is the Attica prison uprising. And some of you probably know about this, but just to refresh your memory, this is uh, the most, I think, uh, deadly uh, confrontation in American prison in American history. Uh, more than 1,000 prisoners seized control of this prison uh, in upstate New York. They took 42 hostages in an attempt to force negotiations about prison conditions, uh, you know, so more toilet paper, uh, more representation, and so on. Uh, and uh, New York, uh, Russell Oswald, the prison commissioner, uh, uh, directed New York state troopers to take back the prison. The siege was put down um, quite uh, violently and with a lot of casualties. Uh, 39 people, including 10 hostages and 29 inmates, were killed in this operation. Uh, and many people, and Pryor was one of them, felt like this was a uh, uh, a bloodbath that show no regard for the life and the, of the prisoners and their human dignity. And so he responded by creating something with uh, Alan Farley, a collaboration. Uh, this is called The Button Down Mind of uh, Russell Oswald. So it's kind of a play on the Bob Newhart album, The Button Down Mind of Bob Newhart, uh, and it's a sound collage, okay? Not your typical, again, stand-up comedian stuff. Pryor was basically turning Russell Oswald and saying this guy was an unwitting stand-up comedian because the lies he was spewing were so laughable on the face, but they were treated as hard and fast truths by so much of white America. So he's engaging with uh, the political uh, you know, militancy, the movements of the early 70s, but with the experimental spirit of the counterculture. It's not like he's writing op-eds about Attica. He's doing, uh, creating early rap poetry uh, also. He's creating the sound collage and, and so on. And what I took from uh, the Berkeley, all, spending time with his Berkeley stuff, and there's much more of that really fascinating material, uh, is that prior um, here, you see he's not primarily driven uh, by the desire for material success. Uh, and I, it might be, seem obvious that when you're creating these kind of sound collages, you're not looking to make big bucks. But a lot of earlier biographers had said that this was what drove Pryor again and again. And even uh, somebody who I think of as a perceptive uh, writer, but he said in his review of my book, he said Pryor was, a, was greedy, um, a man driven, I said, driven by enormous greed. And I, having written this book, I, I can't think of it, I say that's a horrible misreading of my book, um, that if there is a path of least resistance, that is the, the path that Richard Pryor almost never took. He never took, so rarely took the big bucks uh, in the time I'm looking at up to 1978. 
Uh, and he instead went for the path of greatest resistance in the culture. And part of the magic of him is that he managed to create inc incredible art uh, while bucking uh, or going against uh, the current. And uh, when I started to see Pryor uh, in this light, a lot of other episodes of his life popped into focus for me. For example, uh, a moment in 1967 um, when he's talking with a reporter from Ebony. And uh, it's the first interview ever in his life where he talks about the fact that he grew up in a, in a brothel. And when he says that to the reporter, she just laughs, the female reporter for Ebony, because she thinks it has to be a joke. It has to be a put on. Um, but prior, uh, later on, he's asked, you know, did you, did you think you were going to make it? What do you think about making it here in Hollywood? And his answer, I think, is very telling and could almost be used uh, to frame my whole book. Um, he said, I never thought about not making it, but the it has nothing to do with show business. The it I'm making is me. Who am I? And it's really that question which dogged him from the start of his life um, through the end of my story. And you see this throughout, it's, it's, it's kind of that's, Berkeley's the place where he most experimentally engages with that question, who am I, what kind of artist am I? But even when he gets his own TV show in 1977 on NBC, he's somebody who every single sketch is different. I spoke to the person who was the director of that program, Richard Pryor Show, and he did stuff with many variety shows, and he said, you know, every variety show tends to have its safe corner. The safe corner is like in Saturday Night Live, it's weekend update. It's the thing that you go back to again and again because you know you're gonna get some laughs when you go back to these expected roles. Um, he said, Richard Pryor, you didn't have any safe corners. And I think that speaks to uh, how he uh, pursued his art. Um, now I'm gonna give you one more, uh, talk about one more moment of discovery, uh, which has to do with his family. Um, and, you know, biographers before me didn't really know what to make of the family in the sense that the family kind of lived in the shadows of history. They worked in the underground economy, and they hadn't been able to find many records of what they did. Um, and so as a result, earlier biographies had really uh, just talked about, um, say, Richard Pryor's grandmother, the most important person in his life, whom he called, she raised him, he called her mama. They basically talked about her through the eyes of, her son, how Richard remembered her. And so long as you black, don't you run from me. Um, there was a sense that, you know, she was the woman who kind of walloped him into wisdom, uh, awareness of what it meant to be black, but also what it meant to live under the dominion, in, within the dominion uh, of a formidable figure like, like her, Queen Marie. Um, so the question was, well, that's how we see Richard Pryor performing his grandmother, but who was this woman? And what, what do we understand about him through her as the person who primarily raised him since his birth mother wasn't around after he was five? Um, and his father, he, uh, Richard Pryor said of his father, um, he had a son, but he didn't want a son. Right? Um, so uh, kind of a moment of awakening in, in uh, my research I was pouring through old issues of uh, Decatur newspapers. And they were from Decatur, Illinois, not that far from Peoria, uh, looking for traces of the Pryor family. And uh, one thing I came up with was uh, I, I found a 10 installment history of the black uh, community in Decatur written by uh, the NAACP secretary. Uh, for the local branch um, indicator. And I was like, okay, now I can hear something about the prior family, the sides, you know, both sides of the family. It was a very long, small print, lengthy. Every installment was lengthy. Uh, none of Richard Pryor's relatives appeared in that 10 installments uh, series by the NAACP secretary. And that was because Richard Pryor's paternal ancestors in Decatur uh, were the kind of people whom the NAACP didn't want to uh, say, use as representatives of the black community. Uh, they were the people who were involved in the kind of illegal economy, uh, bootlegging, uh, working around brothels, uh, gambling, and, and so on. So you had to look elsewhere, not in the NAACP, uh, to find traces of uh, Marie Pryor and so on. 
and there was, when I started looking for it, uh, I found that there was quite a lot. And you can go on my website, and you'll fi find all these original articles, and you can and look at them. But one that I found quite revealing about what kind of person Marie Pryor was. You know, she was somebody who married in, in her early teens, uh, beaten uh, by her husband. She leaves him behind and becomes this entrepreneur uh, who's running uh, um, kind of a speakeasy. Uh, she runs brothels, she runs a tavern, uh, she runs a beauty shop, restaurant, I mean, all these different things. But this is one article that I think speaks to who she was, too. This is from October 20th, 1929. The article is, Boy Slapped, Woman Routes Proprietor. And it's the story of, at that point, she was known as Marie Bryant. And basically, she, the story of this article is that a black boy had been slapped in a confectionery, basically like a little bodega uh, in um, Decatur. And it was about a, a block and a half from where um, Richard Pryor's grandmother lived. Uh, the black boy was slapped by um, one of the Greek American proprietors of that confectionery. And so she went in there with some sort of cudgel and just started walloping on the woman who was behind the counter, white woman. She kept walloping until she opened up a flesh wound, uh, and the woman ran out screaming to the street for refuge. And at that point, Marie Pryor, she did not leave. She held her ground. How did the police in Decatur react? Well, you can imagine, things haven't changed that much from 1929. They summoned five police to subdue one 30-year-old um, black woman. Uh, but she held her ground, and she was processed um, for assault. Um, but the story actually doesn't end there, because if you keep going through the Decatur Herald, you, just, you see that after she was um, charged with assault, she actually charged the people who ran the confectionery with assault. As if to say, and I, I'm only speculating here, as if to say either you started it by slapping the black boy, or you, st you started, you were just as involved in this uh, beating uh, as I was. You're complicit. So Marie was a woman who unsettled Jim Crow in a way unrecognized by organizations like Decatur's NAACP. Um, but she's in, important for us to understand uh, the kind of the strength of the black community uh, in Decatur and later in Peoria where she moves and sets up. Here is um, the image of the family. That's Marie Pryor in the middle. Uh, Buck, Richard Pryor's father, on the right. Uh, his mother, Gertrude, uh, in the white on the left. Um, and this was a world uh, of much greater freedom, as, as my little uh, preview uh, movie sh suggests. Um, it was a world where all the taboos that structured the Jim Crow world loosened. And here's an incredible image that is from the cache of family photos that Richard Pryor's sister uh, let me re reproduce. Um, this is a place where you know, white and black could commingle, uh, could fraternize, uh, could you know, engage in social relationships. Um, so it's important to, re uh, to take this in as a biographer. You kind of like, where did Richard Pryor's strength come from? Where did he have the guts uh, and the kind of gumption and the strength of mind to keep challenging Jim Crow in the 60s, in the 70s, to challenge the workings of Hollywood, the formulas of comedy. And so much of it, I think, comes from this intense relationship he had with Marie, uh, who was strong in her own way, in her own way that was appropriate uh, or came out of uh, growing up on kind of the, the, the shadow side uh, of the black community uh, in early 20th century uh, Decatur. And I'm going to end uh, with, with a last um, reflection on the complexity of Richard Pryor's act. Um, you saw that he, when he's performing, uh, the s sketch is called Discipline, you know, how he was disciplined uh, by uh, his grandmother. There's so much uh, skill in that act. Um, I mean, that's one reason so many comedians borrow from him, because it w he wasn't just a, a mimic or a great storyteller or a great teller of jokes, or a great improvising actor. He was all these things at once. And he was using all those different techniques to animate very complex dramas. Um, and here, 
you have a sense that you know, he is the perpetrator of this violence. He plays Marie, uh, and he's in some ways sympathetic. She's not a villain. You know, um, she seems in some ways righteous. Um, he, for whatever reason, remembers how he was beaten, but doesn't focus on the why. You know, there's no, he doesn't uh, ruminate on the fact that he didn't deserve to be beaten, right? Um, meanwhile, he also has great sympathy um, for the victim, for the child who feels like this is um, an unjust sentence or just wants to escape the world of pain that comes with living in the world of Marie. Um, but he goes beyond that, and he's also the, the narrator who's framing this experience uh, and ironically thinking about it, ironically commenting on it, finding the humor, the absurdity in things which most people would not think were funny at all. And that, I think, is, is, gets at, and I'll just end here, with the, the gift of Pryor, you know, is to present these situations um, which we recoil from. We don't want to look too closely at them. Um, but we need to, because that is the kind of complicated world we live in. It is a world, in many ways, of pain, of brutality, but also of family, joy, and humor. And Richard Pryor gives it to us straight uh, in all of its complexity. So I'll end there. I'm happy to take questions if people have them. I, I know I went a little over. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, uh, so Richard Pryor, I mean, um, this gets at some of the kind of ways how little was known about his life. Um, you know, nobody had talked to the sisters before. Other biographers not even known that there were sisters. And that's because uh, his, he was the only um, son or child that his father publicly owned, you know, uh, uh, in terms of he was the only person who bore the Pryor name. And then uh, Richard Pryor's father had several other children um, but they all have different last names. And if you go into Peoria and you start talking to people, uh, they'll say, oh, you should know this person. They are Richard Pryor's sister. Uh, and then you find out, actually, they, they knew him, even though they weren't raised like he was on North Washington Street in those brothels in the 40s. Uh, so uh, you know, I found that um, you know, it, it, it was a question of establishing my credibility, because by the time I had talked to the sisters, I already knew so much about the world of the Priors in, in Peoria. And I could even teach them a few things that maybe they had missed because they left Peoria at some point or they didn't know this person. And then it was a question of just being open to their whole experience. And I think one thing that they got from living in that world of Richard Pryor is, is a great honesty about um, the problems of their family. So that's kind of a, I mean, there's some moments in my book that are, I think, very upsetting about what it was like uh, to grow up as a as a girl in this family, and they were they did, uh, w one of them said to me that they felt like a book could be written about the hidden priors, the people who weren't claimed by the family that it's were outside the mythology, and that's why I say one thing that I was trying to do in my book is is really um, bring women's voices more to the fore, um, partly because Richard Pryor was so shaped by the women in his life who raised him who mentored him, and obviously then he was involved in all these uh, relationships, intimate relationships with women, it's an important part of his life. So uh, I think that fills out the portrait of who he was and uh, also that relationship between his art and his life, which is so important to any biography. Okay. Yes. Physically? Okay, so the thing, one thing, you know, I, you know, basically, um, it's, there's, that's one of the mysteries I never solved is exactly when they left. And, you know, what I know is that Marie Pryor was busted. Her speakeasy was busted um, in, I believe, 1929. And then somewhere in the early 30s, they show up in Peoria. Now, the thing to know about Peoria, and I, my little movie, you know, alludes to this, is that it was known as the most hopping sin city in the Midwest. You know, people in Al Capone's Chicago organization, 
they would come to Peoria and they were like, we have never seen anything like this. We thought our territory in Chicago was loose. This is crazy. It's, it's you know, gambling, corruption, prostitution, with absolutely no interference from the law. So what I've been able to trace is that basically um, there was a, and because it was that kind of place, it meant that if you were a black woman who ran a brothel, you could actually make a fair amount of money and be a, a somewhat prominent member of the community. So there had been a line of black madams in Peoria, up to a woman who's known as Diamond Lil, who ran this big black and tan uh, brothel. And she was busted, and I think it's 1931 or 32. She ends up killing somebody uh, uh, in, in, a, in a brothel fight. And um, it's not like, you know, when she gets sent to jail, her brothel closes. And what do you know, uh, kind of opens up a space of opportunity and Marie Pryor sets up her own brothel on that same street, about a few doors down, one or two years later. So anyway, I don't know exactly how, they, it's, it's pretty close, Decatur, Illinois, and uh, Peoria, Illinois. Yes? Thank you very much for your talk. Um, so where did you live when you were staying in Berkeley? Uh, yeah, I can tell you exactly. He lived near McGee and University. Um, that's where he, well, so he started off when he was living with Alan Farley. It's a, it was like a, a house or an apartment, very small apartment on University Way. You know, it's like right next to University um, in central Berkeley. And then he moves when he kind of gets his own place. But it's just like a, it's a place that uh, his companion at the time said like they had padlocks on all the doors, not like keys, you know, like. Um, and he was just there with a bed and a record player and some books. Um, really stripped down his life. So that was on University of McGee, near where there's now an animal hospital. And uh, if you look at their studies of Berkeley um, political opinion at the time, and you know, people were like, wanted to know what's going on with this Berkeley earthquake, and they discovered that that place where he moved to was really the kind of epicenter of the Berkeley political earthquake. It was the most radical part of Berkeley. Um, it was the most mixed part of Berkeley. Uh, in terms of interracial, in you know, population, and the political scientists who had sampled uh, Berkeley population found that when you went to West Berkeley, it was more black uh, demographically, but it was more liberal. There was a kind of a radical uh, measure for community control of the police, and the people who supported the community control of the police were in that central Berkeley area where Richard Pryor settled, which was very young and again had a lot of kind of kind of, there were black radicals, there were white radicals, and they were kind of feeding off one another. So that's a good question. I loved your book. Um, well, thank, thank you. That's very kind. I, I was wondering about, um, you know, he's one of our great improvisers in any artistic mm -hmm. medium, I, I, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, definitely in his Berkeley years, I can, I can, with Berkeley seven months he spent here, I know exactly what he was listening to because he talked about it over and over again, which he was listening to Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. And he's asking that self about his own life, what's going on? Uh, but, uh, which a lot of people were listening to at the time, of course. It's an incredible album that kind of brings together music, uh, politics and soul. Um, but in terms of, you know, he grew up in a world that was a jazz world. Uh, he, at the tavern that his parents, uh, his family ran, the famous, it was called the Famous Door, which was a name copped from a jazz club, famous jazz club. And, uh, you know, he saw all these jazz greats, uh, and there was a lot of kind of quartets and so on. He had a very long time relationship with the Peoria's best bebop pianist. Um, and he loved scatting. Something that people don't know that much because he didn't really, uh, I've never been able to find an actual recording of him scatting. Uh, but he said that his favorite uh, song was uh, the Clark Terry song. Um, I forgot the name. Uh, Bubbles? What is, do you know the name? Uh, it's like Clark Terry, the great trumpeter, had this incredible scatting song. And um, that's, uh, that's what he would, when he was hanging out with some jazz musicians at a really wonderful time in his life, that's what he would do. He would, you know, scat. Uh, but in terms of you know how he became an improviser, 
I, it's, it's something that I feel is one contribution of my book, is to kind of think about how he, how did he, where did he come up with that kind of method of, you know, being a comedic improviser um, and doing it not just by himself, but often with other people when he was acting, you know, say in Hollywood. And so I talk about uh, how when he first came to New York, uh, he was hanging out at this club called The Improv. And that was really a breeding ground for a new kind of uh, improvisation on stage and comedy. When they called it the improv, they thought it was going to be not for comedians. They thought it was going to be for the Broadway people to come there after hours and just sing, like Judy Garland. And Judy Garland did do that. But the comedians took it over. And they established these new games. Like the theater games that now, if you do improv comedy, it's all about these kind of games. Well, Pryor was really at the very first generation of comedians doing that in New York. So that's, I think, where the, the jazz uh, sensibility came from. Uh, he had a, you know, a friendship was a bit prickly with Miles Davis. Um, and he always was very in tune with artists who came out of the jazz world. You know, a lot of the soul musicians he loved, they had their roots in jazz, like Maurice White, who you know, recently passed. So uh, that's a great question. And definitely, I think that something I, I find liberating about him is how much he um, cultivated the art of performing in the moment. You know, he never wanted to repeat himself. And that burdened him intensely. It made him very anguished at times, because he didn't know if he would come up with something. But the only alternative was to repeat yourself. And that was much worse by his uh, lights. Well, thank you so much, Scott. My pleasure. Just a reminder again that Revolution Books is selling at the front, and he'd be happy to sign any of them. So thank you, and we hope to see you back next month.